The SAT and ACT are making efforts to evolve and adapt with the times. But does it just lead to watered down assessments that are more focused on convenience rather than achievement? Our friend Jason Bedrick from Heritage published an article outlining how classical education offers hope for civic renewal in America. Plus, we get to hear the inspiring story of a family that dropped everything and uprooted themselves to get their kids a classical education. My name is Soren Schwab, and this is Office Hours with Jeremy Tate. Welcome back to the Anchored Podcast, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Office Hours. I'm joined here with none other than our founder and CEO, Jeremy Tate. How are you, sir? Soren, I'm great. I'm great. You know, it's, it's a funny time to kind of do current events, you know, podcasts with, with so right. much of the noise being sucked out with the, you know, political conventions and, and of course, you know, the big, the big news nationally with the assassination attempt. Uh, but I, I still think the most exciting news, you know, is is this movement and the things that we're going to talk about uh, today. So I'll always love doing this with you, brother. Absolutely. No, I, I, I agree. I agree. And we'll get right into it. Um, a lot of changes come into to standardized testing. I don't know if you could have predicted that when you found it, when you found it, CLT. Obviously, you wanted to disrupt, but it looks now you're you're actually leading the way and other organizations are, are following. So when you founded CLT, um, two hours uh, 120 questions, right? Pretty straightforward. Um, what thinking went into that? Because now we're seeing SAT, AC, S, ACD, ACD kind of going that that same that same way. You're surprised by that? Yeah, you know. So it's one of these. Uh, I spend a ton of time thinking about this because for for most companies, most entities, you know, updating, changing. You know, you take an example like Blockbuster and and getting pushed out of business right after their high because they, they couldn't evolve and they were more committed to a product, you know, than they were to a mission. Mm -hmm. um, standardized testing though is a bit unique and in some ways precisely the value is not changing, not chasing, chasing educational fads. I mean, the, the current SAT is, is completely, you can't even recognize the old SAT yep. and the new SAT, right? What they're testing, what they're testing has completely changed by their own admission, right? The test that was founded as the scholastic aptitude test, now the CEO says they have removed every last trace of aptitude testing because they say that that's not fair, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's been a, a really wild story. And the fact that there are still people out there who think that the SAT is some kind of fixed, non-evolving assessment is, is, is really, really wild. It's, it's completely different than the test it's set out to be. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's 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 changed significantly. And and I sometimes I don't know that's completely true, but I sometimes tell schools when they ask, well, why is there another test? I said, well, if the SAT were still the SAT from the 70s and 80s, maybe there wouldn't be a need for CLT. Right? <laughs> I agree, totally. Very yeah. different test from the ACT. But now they're going digital, uh, digital only, and they're going to be an adaptive test. Which for our listeners that don't know. Um, essentially, the, uh, the questions you encounter as you move through the test depend on how you answer the prior questions. So you're essentially presented with questions, questions tailored to your abilities, which is very different from, from CLT. So that's, that's a, big, a big change. But I think one thing, too, uh, you know, we haven't even talked about content, which is really interesting. And I quote here from, from uh, a spokesperson for the SAT, uh, quote, questions are also more concise. For instance, lengthy reading passages were replaced with shorter versions. Only one question rather than multiple is tied to each reading. We still want students to read rich texts that they need. Oh, sorry. We still want students to have rich texts that they need to read, understand, analyze, and answer questions about. But these walls of text were just not going to work on a digital mm. uh, device, <laughs> which is fascinating. Um, yeah. Right. So now. It is still a college entrance exam, but a student is not asked to read by their own admission, uh, uh, admission a rich test, text that they need to read, understand, analyze. I mean, it, yeah. what, what's going on here? So, so how does it become valuable for colleges in any sense that ought to be having students read and understand lengthy works, long passages, right? If, if the college board is not assessing a student's ability to pay attention for five minutes, right? We're talking about reading passages that are now capped at 150 words, as short as 20 words, right? Talking about a short text or a tweet or something, right? right. So I, I don't have, you know, Soren, that big of issue with adaptive testing, and it's actually not new. The college board is late to adaptive testing like everything else. Um, adaptive testing is not our concern at CLT. Our concern is just the impoverished content 
that they're using their bias against the Christian, Catholic, Western intellectual tradition, censoring that tradition out in so many ways. That's a real concern, you know, with uh, with the College Board, for sure. Absolutely. And as you know, you know, if it's not on the test, it might not get taught. And so now, you know, if if, if students to get into the Harvards and the Yales and, and, and you know, are, are simply asked to read and understand tweets, then how is that going to impact what high schools are going to teach to prepare those students to get into these quote unquote elite institutions? It's certainly a, a sobering trend that, uh, you know, I tweeted at the college board and said, hey, you know, maybe you want to take a look at a, an online CLT because we're proving that it is possible to read a lengthy passage on a digital device and answer questions about it. Well, it, it, I, I think th this gets into actually very quickly into a conversation about about moral formation, right? It, it is it is a task that goes beyond when we talk about the ability to put a phone away, put distractions away, and to focus on a text and to contemplate it, you know, for more than a few minutes. It's We're talking then about what kind of a person you are, right? Have you cultivated that discipline to be able to, it's talking about, we're talking about discipline. Have you cultivated that discipline to be able to, to do that? And I think that's where we get to the fact that we have a, an entirely different vision right. for what education is than the college board. They've abandoned education as human formation, as moral formation, and they're going to continue to spiral until they can recover something, something transcendent and true. Certainly. And we haven't talked about the ACT and mostly because um, the, the news from ACT just reached our desk this morning, so we haven't even been able to to read through everything carefully. But the ACT two is evolving. Um, ACT obviously was was, uh, was 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 formed as a so to speak competitor to College Board in the 1950s. Clear achievement test, which now of course the SATs as well. Uh, but they're evolving to pretty much be more like <laughs> like the SAT, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're they're uh, emphasizing flexibility giving students the ability to essentially like a choose your own adventure um, on when they, <laughs> when they take the science yeah. section in the reading. So you can, apparently you can, uh, um, let's see here, like the writing section, science will be offered as an additional section. This means students can choose to take the ACT or the ACT plus science or the ACT plus writing or the ACT plus science and writing offering maximal, maximal flexibility. So we will see, I can't comment on that too much yet, but it certainly changes um, coming to the ACT as well. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, if one likes to look at numbers of ACT recently, um, then we probably also know why, because they've been struggling quite a bit uh, in the last few years. Uh, topic two, a uh, good friend of ours, uh, Jason Bedrick um, from the Heritage Foundation, wrote a, uh, I thought, a fascinating piece uh, in the Daily yeah. Signal called Rising Trend of Classical Education Offers Hope for Civic Renewal. And you mentioned, obviously, our current events. Um, and, uh, you know, free people requires an education in the civic knowledge and virtues necessary to preserve liberty, right? That goes back to our, mm. our founding. Um, but you've been ringing the alarm bells uh, for a while now that uh, America's education system is currently failing. Um, in this duty. And so let me just give you a couple of examples about, you know, history and, and civic education uh, and how alarming mm. that is. And then let's talk about the potential solution here. According to the yeah, Public Policy Center's annual survey, one third of American adults cannot name the three branches of government and 17 percent can name any branch at all. Likewise, only 5%, 5% of America, Americans could name all five freedoms guaranteed on the First Amendment. 20% couldn't name any. And one more, the, uh, earlier this year, U.S. Chamber of Commerce found that more than 70% of Americans failed a basic test of civic literacy on, quote, basic functions of our democracy, end quote. I can go on and on and on, national mm. assessment of education progress and, and whatnot. Uh, but the reality is that it seems like... Um, we are letting go of, of the teaching of history of, of civic um, knowledge. Uh, do you have a sense of where, where that's coming from, uh, where we, how we got here? Mm. Yeah, you know, and, and I think the problem is is twofold, right? It, it's a knowledge problem, but it, but it's also a heart problem. Hmm. And this is why I'm so encouraged with what the classical schools are doing. And, and look, I think it's great, and I commend the efforts of governors around the country uh, and Bill of Rights and everyone else. Uh, to try to have a civics class added that we have a crisis of civic knowledge and we don't know, as you just said, how many branches of government are. And most, you know, 81% of people under 45 can't pass a U.S. citizenship test. So that is a crisis. But 
what the classical schools understand is that you, you don't just need to know, but you need to love freedom. You need to love America's founding ideals. You need to believe that they're actually worth fighting for. You know, I, I saw a map recently of Europe and America and the percentage of young people that are willing to fight for their country. And it's extremely low, right? And the rest of the world is watching that. It's because we haven't cultivated a love for freedom, a love for self-government. Right. And it's, it's at a point now, Soren, I, I really think it's a national security threat. Yeah. Uh, but, but praise God that these classical schools are absolutely blowing up. And I, I think classical ed is the answer to the crisis. And love, I love Jason and I love that he, he made this bridge. He made this connection. Classical education is the answer to the civics crisis. Yeah, no, absolutely. Of course, as, as an immigrant to this country, I was shocked because, of course, I, I moved here because I, I love America and, and the ideals of America. Now I often find myself as the one defending uh, the country that I moved to because, you know, you know, America is, is, is this or that. Um, but it, but it starts, it, it does, it starts in schools. And, and I was shocked the other day. I, my wife told me one of her nephews, he's 10 years old, um, is not unfortunately going to a, a classical school. And, and, um, and uh, they spend 4th of July together and they had conversations and again, 10 years old, but he was talking about how stupid he probably used a different word America is and that it is so racist. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it is, so this, and he, he was, and of course he didn't quite know and when pushed couldn't really answer that, but, but that's what we're instilling, right? Like the sense that we are, we are not a country worth defending or loving. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think we're seeing now that he, even though the, the optimistic projections about the growth of classical education, uh, they're being surpassed, you know, in big ways. I mean, you, you know, this, they, they can't keep up with, with the man. We're about to talk about a great story of families moving across country right. to find, you know, these kind of schools. Um, and so uh, my hope and prayer is that it's not too late. I mean, there, there is a country to save. And to do that, we, we have to recover real education, which is classical yeah. education. Yeah. And, and board member at Heritage Foundation President um, Kevin Roberts, and I quote him here, uh, he did say, classical education gives us the chance to rekindle the flame of the West before it mm. goes out. Um, mm. So just to give you some statistics, you've probably heard those before, but maybe our audience uh, has not. Uh, but according to a recent analysis by Arcadia Education, more than 670,000 students attended over 1,500 classical schools during the 2023-24 school year. And Arcadia is projecting that by 2020, uh, sorry, 2035, more than 1.4 million students will be enrolled in classical schools, either in schools or at home. And quite honestly, I, I think that's low. I, mm -hmm. I venture a guess and say that that might actually be be more than that. So. Uh, and, and why why is that? Well, talk about our third topic, because families are flocking to these schools, literally yeah. uprooting their lives uh, because there is still a uh, of course, a, there's not there's high demand, but there's there's not as many schools out there just yet. And so uh, this story, I believe it was in The Federalist um, by the wonderful Christy Elliott Rivers uh, titled I Moved My Family Across the Country for Classical Education. And you can, mm. what an inspiring story, Jeremy, why don't you share some of the highlights from well, that? It, 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 it rung true with me because, you know, we, we've met so many of these families, right? And, and you've been in way more K-12 classical schools than yep. I have, you know, but, but you know this, we go down to Regents of Austin, we go to Veritas and Richmond, you know, we meet these families that have given up, you know, did exactly what Christine did and they wanted to go to a classical Lutheran school and they packed up everything, sacrificed everything. And what I think about Tucson is what that communicates to the kids. Right. I remember when I was at Mountain of Sales Academy, a, a dad said, we, we just moved into one of the worst neighborhoods in Baltimore because that's how bad I wanted my, my daughter to get an education here at Mountain of Sales Academy. You know, when parents see that when kids see their parents sacrificing everything so they can get the best possible education, it, it's a beautiful story. But people people back home also take note and say, man, we're, we're losing families and we're not providing the kind of education. Like, why is everybody moving to Florida? You know. Okay, because you got amazing classical charter schools in Florida. You've got amazing, you know, classical Christian schools and Catholic schools, and and they're being able to to use their own taxpayer dollars now right. to 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 do that. So I was inspired in, in reading what, what Christina and her family did, and uh, and also just it, it made me remember so many great conversations. I remember like it was like a back to school night at Veritas I got to go to a few years ago with Keith Nix and. And met so many of these families, and many of them had relocated as well yeah. to be in that community uh, and, and, and to have their kids receive that kind of yeah. education. Yeah, and, and truly, it, it's, a, it's a change in culture. But I, I thought the article was so nuanced as well, because it wasn't a blind, you know, 
you get your kid to classical school and magically everything is going to be solved, right? And, and one thing that Christine is pointing out that, and I quote, the school did not magically raise our children for us. We found a school that would partner with us and support what we do at home. We did not want a school that would contradict us for eight hours a day. We wanted teachers who shared our values and would teach our children the things we believe to be valuable. But even just that, right, when you're looking at the, the language and the rhetoric of some of the teachers' unions, you know, they're our children, right? Like, you know, you bring them to yeah. a, uh, and, and classical school understand that parents are the primary educators. And even just that it was probably not controversial to say 10, 15 years ago, but it seems now um, even to be divisive uh, come November that that parents are the primary mm. educators and the school's role is to partner with with families. And that's probably the experience that you've had. At, I, want to say. I really loved and, and maybe maybe that that perspective, you know, my, my understanding is that she, she actually is a teacher at the school as well now. Mm -hmm. And you know, once you, it's easy to actually idealize a lot of these classical schools, and they are great, they are wonderful, but you know, a lot of them are also very new. And mm -hmm. and once you kind of get, you know, there's there's growing pains with that as well. So I, I think it's important that we're all trying to recover this beautiful vision for education that was almost lost, right? Uh, and I, I thought that it was, as you said, a very nuanced perspective of was it worth the sacrifice? You know, absolutely, but. It's not just get your kids in a classical school and you've done your job, right? right? The parents are still the first and primary educators. And, and what's so fun for me as a dad, I didn't receive this kind of education. I mean, a little bit in seminary, I, I did for sure and was exposed to it. But I feel like I get to be on my, my kids are at Divine Mercy Academy and I get to be on, you know, I never read Johnny Tremaine before, you know, yeah. reading that with my boy, Johnny. I, I get to kind of have a second education as well. And a lot of parents are, are experiencing that with their kids right now. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Amazing. Amazing. Well, Jeremy, before I let you go, um, uh, Twitter X has been has been a really good platform for CLT for you personally. Uh, and just recently, our marketing team, we've we've kind of uh, started doing some what are called threads, Twitter threads. Um, and so if for our audience, check it out, even you don't have to get an account on Twitter, but you can still look at them. Uh, but we had one with the most beautiful libraries in the world. And just recently, one with the most beautiful bookstores um, in, in the world. And just maybe a little brief preview. Do, do you have a, a favorite a bookstore of that list? You know, I, I think, um, well, the first thing that comes to mind, Soren, is, is why did these kind of threads blow up? You know, yeah. we think about some of our friends, you know, or that culture critic and others. And I think it reflects kind of this, this deep, deep hunger for beauty, you know, that we see. But look, I'm, I'm biased. My personal favorite is going to be Goldberry. I believe it's number 21 on that list, uh, in Concord, North Carolina, Founded by by Cersei folks, the current family, uh, certainly the one that I would recommend uh, over over any other. What's your favorite, Storm? Um, I actually haven't been able to look. At, I haven't looked at the thread yet, so I, I can't tell you on the list. But I, I was just recently in Paris and went to to Shakespeare and Company in in Paris, and, uh, and and not only the bookstore itself. It's not the most beautiful one, but just the history and knowing, you know, that James Joyce wrote Ulysses, you know, in a corner. In that wow, I mean, that that is just. It, it was a really 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 special uh, moment in a special bookstore. So that would probably be my, my favorite. Now, yeah, people are so, are so hungry for this, absolutely. you know, and, and I, I think that's why we keep seeing these kind of things blowing up on social media. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Well, Jeremy, as always, thank you so much. This has been delightful. And I already look forward to our next off hour. Jordan, thank you, brother. Great to chat.